Hello, and welcome to the latest in the Good Faith Cybersecurity uh, Researchers Coalition series of podcasts with interesting people around the world of information and cybersecurity, uh, where we discuss topics relevant to coordinated vulnerability disclosure, ethical hacking, laws, policy, and technology. I'm joined today by uh, Zoltan uh, Balash. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He is the head of vulnerability research, uh, head of the vulnerability research lab at Cujo AI. It's a company focusing on smart home security. So it's very, very good, uh, um, uh, and relevant since we'll also be talking about security and, and bug tracking in the IoT space. He's previously worked as CTO for an antivirus testing company as an IT security expert in the financial sector and as senior security consultant. And he's, he's also the developer of a number of, uh, open source components, including uh, the hardware firewall bypass kernel driver, uh, the encrypted browser exploit delivery tool, and the sandbox tester tool to test malware analysis sandboxes. A link to all of these in the in the video uh, in the video description, uh, as well as uh, Zoltan's company and his current uh, LinkedIn profile. So feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions. So um, before we jump in, is there anything that you'd like to add in terms of introduction, who you are, where you come from, and 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 then we'll start talking about some of the some of the the, the topics that you, you you shared with me before our our recording. Yes. Uh, so greetings, everyone. Uh, I have uh, started my career in IT security. I believe when I first met my first exploit. And it was around 1999 when I was hanging out on IRC and a friend of mine introduced me to a tool called Modern Blitz. And practically what this tool does is that it sends some magic network packets to someone where you have to know the IP address, but in case of IRC with DCC chats and whatever, you always know someone else's IP address. And uh, when the device replied back, uh, the modem, because back then we used dial-up modems, the modem will interpret the packet as a disconnect message. Um, if you might remember, this was the famous ATH++ command. Uh, anyway, back then uh, I was really, really fascinated that you can do stuff like this with computers. And honestly, I did not really use this tool, uh, not as much as my friends, but uh, I think this was the first time when I got introduced to hacking and related things. And yeah, ever since uh, I in the university, I was really fascinated by IT security. And since then, I'm in IT security full time, all day, all night. Uh, it has that industry. This industry has a tendency to suck you in um, pretty full time. I, I know the feeling. And uh, thank you very much for making me feel old with um, modem command string references. I if you're if you're as old as as you know, I'm 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 worse than you. You now had that sound playing in your head. You know exactly which one. Um, so you know, Captain Crunch sends his regards. Uh, so the first thing I want to jump right in on is is in your in your topics that you shared with me for preparation you 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 um you wrote something that's a little bit provocative and I, I as I mentioned in our last attempt to record this foiled by technical difficulties um this this is this merits a whole podcast on its own I quote IT securities in the Stone Age do tell let's go yes <laughs> yes um. So it was not that far away in the past uh, when we started creating computers and it's still in uh, like, have we spent 50, no, 40 years knowing that there is something related to IT security because now that we connect computers together in the network, maybe we should protect those. And I believe if human civilization is still alive in like 200 years, then when we look back what we did uh, regarding IT security, we will say, oh, those were living in the Stone Age. And, uh, you know, it's so primitive what we are doing now. Uh, if we compare things to, for example, architecture, uh, 
when civilization started, we were living in the caves. And then we came up with something better. We built some fancy stone and mud houses. And they were not great compared to the uh, sky towers uh, people can build nowadays. But yeah, they got the job done. And I believe this is exactly where we are today with IT security, that we can build mud and stone houses, but we are far, far away from building skyscrapers, especially when it comes to, for example, responsibility, like how many AV companies will tell you that, yeah, buy your product. And if you have a ransomware, we will just pay the ransom. Doesn't matter. And, and, you know, in, in, in response, I, I do want to say everything is relative. Uh, and while you were talking from the, my shelf of, of magic toys in the background, I pulled out a Klein bottle and this is uh, Cliff Stoll's company. If anybody uh, recognizes the name, uh, he wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg in 1989, uh, chasing a bunch of East German hackers for cocaine. Uh, that was kind of my start uh, with fascination in this. I think relevant. Relative to that, we, we've made a lot of advancement, especially in, in topics around security assurance, uh, patching policies, good practices. But, you know, I, I, I thoroughly agree that we have a huge way to go. And I, I think one of the areas that you also mentioned that I would like to segue into precisely because this is one where I would wholeheartedly agree with you that we're still banging rocks together. And you mentioned IoT security. Uh, and you also mentioned end of life devices and, 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 you know, I'm I'm a member of a of an informal startup investment consortium. And end of life not only devices but legacy code is a huge topic. IoT um embedded systems, you know, whatever, you know, control controller drivers, industrial control systems, uh uh software patches is a massive issue and when those when those two combine you know, older webcams, older routers, older, older, you know, manufacturing machinery, we, we, we often have a huge problem. So you obviously, since you work in, in a company that does home security systems, right? You have experience with, with finding vulnerabilities and researching bugs in, you know, non classic systems. When people think of software and operating systems, they're often not thinking about their smart thermostat. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that. So you, you, you mentioned here, you have a history of, of, of IOT device, um, uh, bug responsible disclosure. Let's, let's start that way. Yeah. Uh, my very first IOT bug, uh, was around, uh, 2015. So around eight years ago. Uh, before then, I already knew about IoT devices, but I just really did not want to buy something from my home because I knew already that they are pretty terrible from a security point of view. But uh, yeah, there was a point in time where I really needed an IP camera. So I was like, okay, let's make a test, go to one of the shops buy the first one I can buy. I will not check uh, the vendor. I will not check how secure it is. Buy it, try to set it up and let's see where it goes. And unfortunately, the device was so buggy that it took me more time to properly configure the IP camera than it took to fully compromise it. And I have a very long blog post about what went wrong with that IP camera, but practically you could say everything. Uh, there are at least three different interfaces how you can hack that device. First of all, default Telnet uh, was enabled on it with username admin, password 12345. And if you check the user manual, it is not listed there that, hey, you have a talent port open with this username and password. Maybe you should check that or change that or whatever. Clearly, there was no user interface to change the password at all. But OK, let's say that you put this IP camera in your home environment and due to the way IPv4 and net works, your talent port is not open to the Internet. Yay. Now, what happens next? Clearly, you have an IP camera because you want to access it 
remotely. So in order to access this remotely, you have to open the ports of the device to the internet. And there are two ways doing that. The first one is UPnP. Uh, UPnP stands for Universal Plug and Play, and it works like that. I buy a device, put it in my home. It tells my router that, hey, I have some open ports. I would like to open those to the internet. Please do that for me. And the router will magically do that. As of today, still many third party and ISP routers comes with UPnP enabled. That's the way it is. Let's say that the user disabled this or it was disabled by default. Still, you cannot access the device. So you have to manually configure the port forward, right? Now, what happens? Now you have an open port to the internet, which ends up in a web application. As far as I remember, as of today, there are at least four different ways how you can have full remote code execution on that device through the web interface. And if you look at what was really implemented in the device, you shouldn't be really surprised because the kernel was from 2004 or six, something like that. The web server was some really, really ancient web server. Yeah, I believe the web server has a known vulnerability again from 2005. And I bought this device 10 years later. And yeah, they, these were just there. And what makes things even worse? Let's say that I don't have UPnP. I don't configure the port forwards. The IP camera will still work because of cloud. It has cloud connections. Um, I think it's not very important where the cloud servers were, but it was in the manufacturer country. Anyway, uh, what's important is that you can also hack the device through the cloud. Uh, in order to connect to the device, you need the device ID and the device IDs were pretty short and it followed an algorithm which can be reverse engineered. So you can guess all the device IDs on the internet. Once you have the device ID, you can connect to the device and just use the authentication bypasses you had on the web interface. Okay, so now your whole device is practically whole and you cannot secure this. What's the next way you can do? I uh, contacted the vendor that, hey, I found this pretty bad vulnerabilities on the device. Please fix them. The answer were, uh, thank you for reporting. We will look into this. That was eight years ago. As of today, zero patch is available for that device. So uh, at, least, at least they responded. I mean, uh, you know, there's yes. a, a podcast with Florian Hantke who found um, a bunch of bugs in some some wedding photograph sites, and like a lot of them just never even got back to them. You know, so at, at, they've they've at least done the very very bare minimum, <laughs> even if they didn't do anything afterwards. Yeah, I have to add that, uh, like some years later, they have. Uh, created a new device. And as far as I know, I did not buy that new device, but as far as I know, they fixed some of the vulnerabilities, but not all of them. So I think the moral of the story is that when I bought the device, it was already 10 years behind of patching, and there was not a single patch ever released to this device. So it was already end of life, but 10 years in the past. Um, luckily, not all IoT devices are that bad, but the challenge is that there have so many of these really bad IoT devices have been sold or that now the whole world is full of these vulnerable and broken IoT devices. Do you remember the... Vigilante hacker, for example, with the Bricker bot story. I don't, I don't remember that one. I'll look it up and uh, I'll link to it in in the description. Okay, it, it was a really interesting oh, story. Was he, was he the guy? Was he the guy that 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 um, 
they they god there was one guy if i remember correctly he scripted attacks on devices and then deployed automated fixes is that is that the one almost uh he could not fix the devices so he practically bricked the devices so they were useless but uh yeah i know people personally know people whose devices have been bricked and i understand their fr- frustration that they bought something and it's not now it's not working anymore but on the other hand these devices were part of huge ddos botnets and those ddos botnets were really a huge risk to the whole internet as we know so and there was no solution like for example, if you look at the IP camera I bought, uh, someone else did some research on how these things work. And turns out that there is one company who creates the code for this camera. And for this exact type, there were like 1,200 or even more different vendors and models who implemented this same code. And what's the problem with this? If there is any new patch to the code base, 1,200 different device types and God knows how many vendors have to update their code. Well, it's not, it's, it's not surprising not. at all. It's not surprising at all. I mean, look, quick, quick anecdote. I, 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 I always used a bunch of, uh, um, access points, very simple devices, uh, from, from a major manufacturer that got acquired. And I bought another one just because it already worked for me without, without thinking about, you know, that I'm actually need a lot more bandwidth. And when it's, when it, when I realized how slow that the thing was, I, I looked it up on, on, um, the DDWRT, the, the open source firmware website and basically realized that they've still, they, at least at the time, they still had this thing in production and it was using like a 20, 25 year old Broadcom chipset. And that chipset is most likely being used by 50 different access point and, and, you know, wireless router manufacturers. And the, as you, as you point out the code, uh, at least firmware code segments that go along with it. So, so this is generally going to be a problem anytime you have that kind of a monoculture, right? So, so, uh, you know, even, even worse than, than being able to, um, to, to, to hack one particular, uh, even if it's a major manufacturer device, if you can, if you can, you know, hit, how many was it? You said 1200? You know? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> you've got an issue. And by the way, I found the name of the, 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 the bot that I was referring to. That was in 2017, uh, was, was, was Hajime, which, which, uh, fixed a bunch of flaws in, uh, in digital video recorders and a few others. I'll link to that as well. Um, so, so there, there's been, you know, it, it, it opens up some interesting legal and ethical, um, questions about, you know, going out and vigilante fixing stuff on your own. But, you know, the intent was good for what it's worth. Yeah, and uh, one interesting side story. Uh, I have, uh, I know someone whose device was bricked and it was uh, like a small company with four cameras and uh, there was this uh, central uh, DVR, whatever, which was practically the single point of failure. And what happened is that all four cameras were streaming hacked. That that was the label that hacked, 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 hacked. And uh, when I asked the owner of the company, what do you think what happened? He told me that, yeah, he believes there is something issues with the rain and the rain somehow broke the camera. And, you know, this is, this is what an average user will think about this. Like, we are talking about uh, complicated things and the average user just does not get this. And what we should do is that the average user does not have to know what Mirai is, doesn't have to know what UPMP is, does not have to know what a secure device is. If they buy a device, it should be secure by default. That's that's what or, we or have to at least, do. At least, at least the the user, and I think this goes in the direction of the European Union and the the security certification for 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 devices, which you know all the manufacturers, of course, scream bloody murder about. Um, 
at least that that the manufacturers follow good risk management practices. As you and I both know, you cannot you you cannot guarantee a device is secure. You can make it secure by design. That doesn't guarantee security. What really puzzles me, you know, sticking on the webcam topic, if you look at uh, a couple of years ago, some some of you may remember Cozy Bear, the guys that hacked, among others, the 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 American uh, one of the American political parties, the Democratic National Committee, and the Dutch Foreign Intelligence Service, the AIVD. They 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 famously um, broke into um, uh, one of the the Russian uh, intelligence services webcam network and and obtained images from you know the actual the troll farm uh where you know and the 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 IT or whatever you call it office farm where they're running these attacks from and very very few people outside the security community made that connection it's okay well if this can happen to the russians well it can happen to anybody right regardless exactly. of whether it was a good thing i happen to think it was a great fun exercise and should be supported but can happen to anybody you know, and I mean, in response to the whole the whole question of of jurisdiction, right, and cloud. Fun anecdote: I bought a smoke detector off AliExpress, one of these cheap Chinese things, knowing full well it's a cheap Chinese device. I have a dedicated firewalled separate network for all of my home devices. No cameras point inward, no microphones that I know of anywhere in the house. You know, says the guy with a cell phone on his desk. Um, my 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 robot vacuum cleaner, my my doorbell, all of these things are on a separate secured network with no access internally, right? On a firewall I set up. Most people aren't going to be that paranoid, right? Yeah. There's there there's that 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 joke about you know the the tech enthusiast says my whole home is smart, and the IT veteran says my printer is 25 years old and I have a handgun next to it in case the the printer makes any noises I don't like, and exactly. and. With this smoke detector, when I set it up, it didn't work. It asked me, what jurisdiction are you in? And I selected, you know, I live in Spain. It didn't work. And I went on a, I finally had found a, a, a Dutch, you know, tech enthusiast site that I had to machine translate where it said it doesn't work unless you select China as a jurisdiction, right? So the manufacturer, this is almost adorable, was conscientious about well you have to agree to select because I mean, they could do whatever they wanted to but I thought it actually kind of cute that they ask you to select China knowing full well that the cloud servers or whatever controls these things are in China right and 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 and, and it kind of implies almost that they will not do anything malicious if you're if you're if you select you know France or Germany or the US or whatever but but it, it's really interesting how how even how some manufacturers have these highly highly inconsistent approaches to jurisdiction and and legal issues and 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 even even beyond their their approach to patching i'm also really yeah. glad that you mentioned mirai because that's exactly what these uh these, these hajime guys were, were looking to patch i mean that if 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 some of you may recall was it was a huge botnet uh when was it 20 2018 before yeah, that before. was hitting enormous, enormous amounts amounts of 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 um, of IoT devices, and and the last thing I want to quickly mention is is you know even even I mean some of these some of these manufacturers actually invested a, a, a I think a minimal effort into security practices right, and I think as we agree you cannot ensure security in, in, in a piece of software. I recall working for a device manufacturer that was looking, was designing a, an implantable insulin pump, right? Bluetooth controlled. Now they fixed this because the security guys got a hold of the design. It had a default Bluetooth pairing code, which was zero, 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 and couldn't be changed. Of course. Of course. Right. (laughs) They meant well. You know, but I just, I think it illustrates all these examples we're giving here. It illustrates the insane, Sanity, you know. Yes. Once you even once you step outside the confines of you know your your Windows, your Mac OS, your your Android, your 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 widespread operating system ecosystems, or your widespread applications in devices, and it, and then you know we 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 talk about older devices. You know the the chips that I mentioned, the 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 camera that was using using the same old tech as ten years ago that you mentioned, right? Who is patching that? 
Yes, exactly. Uh, when it comes to Mirai, uh, actually, there's a very recent, amazing article. I believe it was on Wired recently. Like, it's a long read. Like, it's more than an hour. But it's a very detailed and amazing story with the teenagers uh, who created Mirai. I highly recommend this for everyone. I, ha- I, have, I have it in front of me. I'll link to that in the description. So that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a good pointer. Thank you. Yeah. And regarding IoT security, um, so one of the reasons uh, our company exists is because of Mirai. Just that's that's it. Like, uh, imagine that uh, it's COVID times, the whole family is at home. You are working from home. Uh, your uh, children are uh, uh, work, uh, teaching, studying from home. And somehow your IP camera gets infected, starts a DDoS attack, and the ISP sees, wait a minute, something fishy is going on on this uh, connection. Let's throttle it or disconnect from the network. And you're like, Jesus Christ, what's going on? And uh, actually, like eight years ago, this was common practice uh, because the... ISPs, they had no idea which device is causing this. And the, there was an angry customer calling the support line and they were trying to figure out what's going on. But no one knew that the IP camera or I don't know, the network at a storage device or whatever is at fault, what was hacked. So, it, so for example, the customer promised, yeah, everything is going fine in our network. Please connect us back. They connected back. It was continued. So it was an horrible experience for everyone. And uh, without the services, what we can provide, now you can de- detect that, hey, this IP camera is DDoSing the whole internet. Let's cut the connection for that IP camera only and everything else should work. So I think that's that's one of the, I really do not want to advertise our company. I am not here for today, but uh, nowadays that's one solution to this problem. But actually, uh, when it comes to IoT security and device security, I am seeing the light in the end of the tunnel. Uh, For example, there are two new great initiatives. The first one is called Matter. Uh, Have you heard about Matter? I haven't. so, uh, but I, but you're going to send me a link, right? Yes. So there's an alliance called Connectivity Standards Alliance. They created Zigbee, and all the big players are part of this alliance: Google, Apple, Samsung, Amazon, everyone. And they are now creating an IoT standard, which will uh, work. Uh, between the different ecosystems. Like previously, if you had a Google device and an Apple device, they will not just connect together. And this matter protocol, it will make sure that these devices can talk to each other in a secure way. And we have looked into this and we can say that, yes, it's really, really good. And like you don't have to set passwords, uh, it's using privacy and security by default. So it's, it's a really great initiative. And other than that, so Matter is just like an application level plot- protocol. So it ensures that the application layer will be good. On the other hand, uh, there is this other project called Zephyr OS and it's a um, real time operating system for IoT devices. And it has all the fancy features you need for a secure IoT device, like secure boot, uh, encrypted file systems, you name it. It's it's really a new thing. There are still bugs. I think someone just found a bunch of vulnerabilities last week, but it's a great initiative. And if you are developing an IoT device today, 
I highly recommend you to check the Zephyr OS because it's it's a really great stuff. It's it's a it's an interesting thought as well in terms of reporting bugs that you you are no longer you mentioned whack a mole and I want to move on to that that bit. Um, that's a great analogy um, that you're no longer chasing down twenty different manufacturers. Uh, one interesting thing that 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 your previous point reminded me of, you know, shutting off the access to that IP camera is. Um, a German initiative called uh, ACDC, the Advanced Cyber Defense Center. I don't know if it's still around. It was EU funded for a while. And they basically sought to collect and disseminate IPs that were spitting out, um, that were part of parts of botnets, whether, whether drones or, 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 um, um, you know, CNC servers and basically tried to, first of all, advertise those to people responsible, the ISPs. Your end user with a night with a webcam is not going to pick up the phone, right? They're not going to answer their mails. Um, and then to just basically get the ISP to shut them off. So kind of mirrored that a bit. We've got about eight minutes left or seven minutes. And I want to quickly move on to a point regarding the disclosure bit, which, because I think that, that your, 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 your bit about Zephyr OS touches on that, you know, about making it easier for vulnerability researchers to report bugs making jurisdictional issues clear, making legal issues clear. Can you talk a little bit about about where you think some of the challenges currently are with bug hunting and reporting? Uh, in the IoT space, uh, I think nowadays the hardest part is trying to figure out who's responsible for the vulnerable code. Like uh, in my case, uh, I notified the vendor, but the vendor they practically had nothing to do with the code itself the only thing they did is they replaced the logo on the camera web server and they put their sticker on the camera that's that's all they did they have no idea what's inside which and is which is the case for a lot of low end consumer electronics devices if you look on amazon for or you know whatever shopping site you use for device xyz you'll find 50 different makers with generic names the exact same thing same stock photos just different logo on exactly. it yeah and trying to figure out what company was responsible for that code and so you can report to the original source that's sometimes almost impossible and if i report this to the vendor I won't know whether this works or not. Will they ever reach out to the original vendor or not? I cannot know. So in the IoT space, I think this is this is the number one issue. And even if uh, another big issue with these, I would say, old gen IoT devices is that, let's say there's a patch for the device, hooray. Who will know about the patch? Because most of these devices, the way you can patch it is somehow the user knows about the patch. Now you lost 99% of the users. You download the patch, you log in, and you hit upload new firmware, and uh, then you start to pray that it will not break it. So no one will do the patching at all. So even if you do try to do responsible disclosure, no, and there's a patch released. No one will install the patches. So you, you cannot really publish what you have found because it will make things just worse. And I was just struggling to look for my, my mute button because, uh, one of the, uh, there, there's a Polish startup that I, um, that I recently spoke to, which has an interesting approach to exactly dealing with this issue. Which is automated patching of, of legacy IoT devices, now, whether it's in, you know, you know, company network or not, um, is TBD, but I'll, I'll see if I can find their name and link to them because they had some pretty cool ideas. Um, I think, I think this also opens up some very interesting discussions that are again worth a whole separate conversation about things like legal, legal responsibility, right? Uh, I, I mentioned the EU's, the, uh, the certification, uh, scheme. Uh, at the beginning of the podcast, but, but if you can't tell who's responsible for actually, um, incorporating and deploying the patches, you know, I mean, the, uh, the GFCRC is focused on, on protecting the legal status of, of ethical hackers such as yourself who try to report these things. 
because in a lot of jurisdictions, precisely that kind of activity is going to lead to threats, lawsuits, whatever, because the manufacturer doesn't want to look bad if they even respond. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you have some company who is based in, I don't know, Vietnam or China or whatever, and are they going to even respond to, to, to bug fixes, you know, even beyond the potential language barrier? So, yeah, so, yeah there's, there's all kinds of not only legal, but also logistical questions that, 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 that raises. Yeah. And also regulations are important and I'm all for regulations, which makes sense. Uh, but, if you regulate the market, uh, it means that the secure IoT devices will end up more expensive. That's just basic economics. So what will happen? Most users will say, oh, that's too expensive for me. Let's check uh, for a cheap Chinese uh, solution and they will ship it for you. They will not care that they are not allowed to sell these devices uh, in the EU. They will just ship it for you. Like you will not find those devices on the shelves, but people will still buy this, I believe. So the regulation itself cannot solve this. Well, it can't, it can't, it can't solve all of it. Put it that way. I think, I think yes. it's, it's an approach for part of it. It does, it does cut down on the num the amount of noise, I, I would think. But again, I think that's a discussion for the lawyers. Um, I want to, we've, we've got two minutes left and I want to invite you. Give me your thoughts about, you know, it's obvious that the GFCRC, our community, our supporters, our stakeholders have an interest in, in driving legal reforms generally around, around bug reporting, around accountability, around, around responsibility. Give me some thoughts on that to, to wrap up with. Uh, it's a very complicated topic. It's uh, no wonder that uh, people are still in uh, flame wars when it comes to responsible disclosure versus full disclosure, but uh, I'm all for responsible disclosure, but it's really hard nowadays. Uh, it's really funny. I just had this conversation recently with my friends that he found some uh, cross-site scripting error on a website, and now he doesn't know whether he has to report it or not, because, you know, it will be a pain. And I told him that Oh, come on. I just uh, stopped searching for these bugs because I don't want to make my life even harder. And that's the sad reality that uh, if you do it as a hobby, then it's just an awful lot of work and you don't know what will happen. That's a natural response of, of legal lack of clarity because a lot of, lot of informal researchers won't even know I mean, kids, students, whatever, they won't even know what they can and can't do. So, so, you know, good argument for good anecdotal, but, but important argument for, for that kind of reform and, 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 um, consistency. With that, I want to wrap up. I want to thank you very, very kindly for your time. Um, I am going to ask you if some of these topics you'd like to discuss a bit, a bit more detail in one of our sister podcasts at some point, because I think they, they deserve a, a little bit more, more in depth, uh, discussion. Thanks very much and stay safe. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.